My girlfriend Stacy and I were so excited to take a weekend autumn getaway to Stowe, Vermont. We booked a charming log cabin on a rental site, eager to take in the peaceful woods and foliage that Stowe is so famous for. When we arrived at the cabin late Thursday evening, we were delighted by the cozy, rustic vibe. The living room was adorned in plaid blankets and antique wooden furniture. It reminded me of the cabins my family would visit when I was a kid. After the long drive, we were tired, so we unpacked quickly into one of the three bedrooms and headed to town for a late dinner. The next morning, we made coffee and enjoyed the view of the woods outside the cabin. The plan for the day was to go on a hike and breathe in the fresh air. We changed into our hiking clothes, grabbed our gear, and headed out on a trail nearby. The hike was so serene and beautiful, with leaves in vibrant shades of red, orange, and yellow all around us. When we returned to the cabin in the late afternoon, we were chatting about how nice the hike was. Stacy suddenly stopped talking and said she heard something strange coming from inside the cabin. She said it sounded like faint music or voices. I listened closely but couldn't make anything out. We realized it seemed to be coming from behind one of the bedroom doors that was locked. This struck me as odd. I messaged the cabin owner about it. He apologized but said he had no idea why that room would be locked. He said he would ask his wife if she had possibly locked her belongings in there before renting out the cabin. I let him know we were happy to stay out of that room. We were just curious about the noise. Stacy and I then headed into town for dinner and didn't think much else of it. Later that night, as Stacy was showering, I heard the faint noise again. This time I could distinctly make out a voice, though I couldn't understand what it was saying. I felt a chill down my spine. I knocked firmly on the mystery door, but no one answered. When Stacy got out of the shower, I didn't want to worry her, so I didn't mention what I heard. But the next morning, the owner called me back saying his wife had no idea why that room would be locked. He offered to come over and unlock it so we could get to the bottom of this. When we returned from breakfast, I went around the side of the cabin and peeked into the window of the locked room while we waited for the owner. To my shock and horror, I saw a man in the room. He looked slightly unkempt and was dancing slowly around holding a small radio. When he saw me, he stopped and stared creepily, then cracked a smile. I yelled for Stacy and told her we had to get out of there immediately. I could tell she was startled and confused, but she trusted me. We frantically grabbed our things and raced to the car. My heart was pounding as I peeled out of the driveway. We decided to just start driving into town. Once we had gotten some distance from the cabin, I called the owner again and told him to call the police immediately because someone was inside. Stacy and I were able to find a motel to stay in for the rest of our trip. Later, the owner called me back and said the police had not found anyone in the room when they arrived, but they did find empty food bags stashed under the bed, indicating someone had been staying there. I felt chilled thinking about that man who had been hiding out so close to us the whole trip. Why was he there, and what were his intentions? Stacy and I cut our trip short and headed home, still rattled by this eerie experience. Needless to say, we won't be staying in any remote cabins again anytime soon. It was October 2016, and I had taken a seasonal job at Party City for the Halloween rush. I worked the closing shifts on weeknights since I didn't have early classes. The location I worked at had extended its hours to 11 p.m. during Halloween season. My shifts usually started at 5 p.m. and went to close. The store would be busy until about 9 p.m., then customer traffic would die down. After 10 p.m., there would hardly be anyone left in the store, especially on weekdays. On this particular night, I started out working as a costume grabber. I would be told on the walkie-talkie what costume and size to grab so I could hand it to the customer to try on. Later in my shift, after it had quieted down, I was told to start cleaning up the aisles, restocking shelves, and moving inventory between the main floor and the basement. I was going up and down the stairs a lot. 
By 10 p.m., there were only about four employees left. Maria at the register, Kyle stocking shelves, Ashley the supervisor, and myself. During one of my trips to the basement, I took a short 10-minute break. When I went back down, the lights had been turned off. I figured Ashley had done it, so I flipped them back on and continued working. As I lifted a box of costumes, I heard something fall on the other side of the basement. I slowly peered around the shelf to see someone standing there wearing a white hooded robe and scary monster mask. I jumped back at first, thinking it was just one of my co-workers messing with me, but as I looked closer, I realized this person was much too tall to be Ashley, and the dirty work boots didn't match Kyle's shoes. I went upstairs without running to avoid suspicion. I shut the basement door and found Ashley and Maria by the register. I asked where Kyle was. He called out from a nearby aisle. That's when panic set in. I told Ashley there was someone else down there. The three of us went to the basement to check, but the person was gone. There was a back door in the costume room they could have used to slip out. Ashley checked the security footage, but didn't see anyone enter except me. Still shaken, I had to go back down to the basement to get the costumies. I thought I heard a noise again, so I quickly brought the box upstairs and dropped it in the costume room. Before turning off the light, I looked down the stairs one last time. The person was there again, only this time without the mask. I saw his smiling face looking up at me. I slammed the door and ran to get help. But by the time Ashley and Kyle arrived, both the basement and back exit doors were wide open. The intruder had vanished without a trace on camera. I don't know if anything was stolen other than the costume he wore. It could have been a prank or something much more sinister. All I know is that I treated it like my life was in danger, and I quit that job soon after. October has always been my favorite month. The temperatures are perfect, never too hot or too cold. The leaves turn beautiful shades of orange, yellow, and red before falling to the ground. As kids, my friends and I loved jumping into piles of leaves. One chilly October evening when I was about 10 years old, my friends Liam and Billy came over to rake leaves on my family's property. We lived in a corner house with a large yard that bordered a quiet, dead-end street. After making a huge pile, the three of us started wrestling and playing in the leaves. Later that night, Liam and Billy wanted to come back for a nighttime triple threat match. By now, it was dark, but a streetlight lit up part of the yard. Right away, we noticed there were fewer leaves. As we tried to add to the pile, Liam saw an odd-shaped mound. He went to rake it over but had trouble moving the leaves. He shouted that something was buried underneath. We brushed away the leaves to find a man hiding there. We jumped back, wondering if it was some kind of Halloween prank. Billy cautiously nudged the leaves off the figure with his foot. But instead of a face, there was just a hollow hard shell. It was a fake body. We looked around to see who played this trick on us. A man jumped out from the bushes laughing. He looked about 60 years old with bulging eyes and crooked yellow teeth. He said he put the fake body there as a joke because he liked to watch us kids play. I was creeped out that he admitted to spying on us. We went back inside, but later that night, I heard a voice outside my bedroom window. It was the strange man again. He pushed up my window and tried to reach for me. I screamed and my dad came running. By the time he got there, the man was gone. The next day, my dad and the police questioned the man who lived across the street. I recognized him as the creep from the night before. His home was a mess, and my dad figured he was a meth addict. I never played in those leaves again. Last October, I was talking to a girl named Nikki that I had met at a party a month before. We had been hanging out about once a week for a few weeks. 
Nikki wanted to do some fall activities, so I suggested we go apple picking. She loved the idea, so we drove about 30 minutes out of the suburbs to a rural apple orchard. We were still 20 minutes away when we passed another orchard down a dirt road off the main road. On a whim, we turned down the road toward a rundown farmhouse. There were no cars or people around. It seemed deserted. The house was poorly maintained, as if no one lived there. Nikki felt uncomfortable, so we left. When we arrived at the original orchard, it too was empty, just a closed sign. I suggested we go back to that first creepy orchard and pick apples, since we'd have it to ourselves. Nikki was hesitant at first, but I convinced her. We parked discreetly and hopped the fence. Walking through the rows, apples crunching under our feet, we felt a thrill doing something forbidden. I started tossing apples playfully at Nikki. She screamed and ran off, telling me to stop. When I found her row empty, I called out worriedly. She said she was picking her own apples a few rows over. I apologized, and she stopped answering. Suddenly, an apple landed in front of me. She was pranking me back. I ran through the rows trying to find her. Turning a corner, I froze. A young man with long black hair stood staring at me. I hurried away, calling Nikki. She said a creepy guy was following her too. We ran to the car and drove off, but then saw him half hidden behind a tree, watching us. We decided to buy apples at a farm stand up the road. The workers there warned us away from that orchard. The owner's son had killed his girlfriend there years ago before disappearing. Nikki and I realized in horror that we may have encountered a murderer. I still get chills wondering if he's lurking there.